Welcome to the Friday, September 14th edition of the MD Edge Daily News. I'm MD Edge editor Mary Ellen Schneider. And I'm MD Edge editor Terry Rudd. Today, the FDA cracks down on companies selling an increasingly popular but unproven alternative to opioids. Also today, multi-day seizure cycles in epilepsy may be quite common. And later, new stroke intervention guidelines raise the bar on mechanical thrombectomy procedures. But we begin today with the impact physician burnout has on the quality and safety of patient care. Burned out doctors are twice as likely to have patient safety issues and deliver a lower quality of care. And they're three times as likely to get a poor rating from patients because of the depersonalized care they deliver. Those are the stark findings from a study published in JAMA Internal Medicine. As lead author Dr. Maria Panagiotti puts it, physician burnout might be jeopardizing patient care. That means promoting physician wellness is key to delivering quality care. Dr. Panagiotti of the University of Manchester in England and her colleagues reviewed 47 studies on physician burnout and patient care, which included data from more than 42,000 physicians. The researchers found that physicians with burnout were 96% more likely to be linked to patient safety issues. They were also 2.3 times more likely to be linked to reduced patient satisfaction, and they were 2.3 times more likely to deliver lower quality care. Dr. Panagiotti says the findings clearly reveal the need for interventions to improve the culture of healthcare organizations, as well as interventions focused on individual physicians. The Food and Drug Administration has issued letters of warning to two companies for making unproven medical claims about their Kratom products. Kratom is a plant-based product that shows a dose-dependent opioid-like effect. It's emerging as a purported pain relief alternative to opioids. For physicians, toxicologists, and federal regulators, however, the absence of evidence-based studies on the herb's effectiveness and safety has raised concerns. The two vendors, Chillin Mix Kratom and Mitra Distributing, drew the FDA's ire for claiming their Kratom products could, among other things, relieve or treat opioid withdrawal. In addition to Kratom's direct health risks, FDA Commissioner Dr. Scott Gottlieb says its use could deter or delay people with opioid use disorder from seeking FDA-approved treatments that are demonstrated to be safe and effective. Kratom is illegal or controlled in several countries, and it's banned in some U.S. states and municipalities. Multi-day epileptic seizure cycles may occur in a substantial number of people with epilepsy, affecting up to one in five patients. That's according to a retrospective cohort study led by Dr. Mark Cook of St. Vincent's Hospital in Melbourne, Australia. About 80% of patients in the study showed circadian modulation of their seizure rates, but a substantial portion showed strong circuseptin, or seven-day rhythms. Significant circuseptin cycles were seen in more than 20% of patients in one analysis from the study. Dr. Cook says the high prevalence of multi-day seizure cycles could offer an opportunity to improve treatment by developing patient-specific chronotherapy or by timing medication to match when seizures would be most likely. What might drive longer seizure cycles? The researchers aren't sure, but peak seizure times might be linked to behavioral changes, such as varying stress levels over the course of the week, seasonal changes in sleep quality, or biologic drivers, such as menstruation. The findings appear in Lancet Neurology. And finally today, new guidelines for treating acute ischemic stroke raise the bar for the number of mechanical thrombectomy procedures that level 1 and level 2 stroke centers should perform annually to maintain a minimum safety threshold. 13 international societies crafted the guidelines. Previous studies have shown lower mortality in high-volume centers. According to the guidelines' first author, Dr. Laurent Pirot of University Hospital Rennes in France. But setting minimum standards can be a challenge, especially in underserved countries and localities. Groundbreaking studies published in 2015 
showed the efficacy of the procedures in anterior circulation, emergent, large vessel occlusion stroke patients. But it's a challenge to deliver the therapy to patients in localities without access to level 1 stroke centers. Under the new recommendations, level 2 centers should perform at least 50 intracranial thrombectomy procedures annually for emergent large vessel occlusion stroke and 120 diagnostic or interventional neuroendovascular procedures per year. The guideline authors acknowledge that newly established level 2 centers may struggle to meet the new minimum requirements, but they say that's okay as long as those centers' volume is expected to meet the minimum within 12 to 24 months. The guidelines also aim to ensure that facilities can handle not only the thrombectomy procedure, but also the medical management before, during, and after the procedure. The guidelines appear online in the Journal of Neurointerventional Surgery. And that's the Friday, September 14th, MD Edge Daily News. Be sure to look for us on Spotify, Amazon Alexa, Google Podcasts, and Apple Podcasts. For MD Edge, I'm Terry Rudd. And I'm Mary Ellen Schneider. If you like what you're hearing, be sure to rate us on your favorite podcast app. Thanks for listening.